when I prepared for this talk, it was uh, for me a lot of fun. I walked down memory lane and I, I remembered back to the times when I first started to think about the leaders of the Soviet Union. I, uh, when Yuri Andropov uh, died, because in the 1983, something like that, um, I was in high school and I just remember the Vancouver newspaper, uh, the province, it just turned into a tabloid newspaper and we started trying to come up with snappy headlines. And so when Andropov died, the headline was Head Red Dead. And uh, which I thought that alliteration was, was quite clever, um, if somewhat offensive, uh, uh, stuck with me. Uh, then when I uh, started my undergraduate degree, that's when uh, Konstantin Chernenko died and Mikhail Gorbachev came to power. And I had a, a history class at that time. And my professor was looking at the whole class. And this was just after we really learned who Gorbachev was, for me anyways. <laughs> uh, the Institute had known this for a while, as I'll talk about. Uh, and we didn't really know much about him. But our, my professor uh, said, this is the first leader who was not born, not alive during the 1917 revolution. So it may be quite interesting to see what happens. And so this is one of the things that made me realize that history professors actually know what they're talking about, not just about the past, but about the present and the future too. Uh, and I kept that in mind. Uh, and it's fun also to give this talk, not just for the, for the memories of that time, but for the actual event in 1993, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was, I think the most consequential figure I ever shook hands with. Um, and probably the most the most consequential figure I'll ever shake hands with because I don't think we'll be shaking hands <laughs> now like we used to. Um, when he came to Carleton to receive an honorary degree in 1993, uh, a year after he was somewhat rudely uh, destatized by Boris Yeltsin and the other leaders of the um, former Soviet, what, what became the former Soviet republics. So this is a, a talk that's that's for me very personal. Um, but one that, that I learned a lot from as well, uh, and also one that was really critical in sort of summarizing a time, a decade of life in the Institute, which was incredibly fascinating and charged. Um, and Larry and Joan and my, my other colleagues who were there um, will have very strong memories of it too. When from day to day, from year to year, things were, were changing, um, we took a lead. Uh, as at that point, the Institute of Soviet and East European Studies, ICES, um, then very briefly, the Center for East, Institute for Central slash East European and Russian Area Studies, CRS, and, and then um, EURES came after that. Uh, we not only had a front row seat, but we did important things. Uh, we were leading um, policy talks, uh, writing papers, uh, who knows what was done with all of them, but I think uh, the Institute can look back and say, uh, we not only trained students, but at the time we did uh, important work that was critical um, to understanding Canada-Soviet relations. Um, you know, I won't say we <laughs> set the course for reforms by any means or anything like that, but I, I do think it's something to really uh, be proud of in terms of our past of our, as an Institute. So what I want to do is bookend the 1993 visit with one that Mikhail Gorbachev took to Ottawa a decade earlier, when he was a member of the Communist Party's Politburo, uh, which was their main, um, basically the cabinet, I would suppose, of the Communist Party, uh, in charge of agriculture. <clears throat> when I first started researching the visit in 1983, just because I thought it was a nice little way to start the talk and, and um, work through a really fascinating decade, I must admit, I've found some of the hype in the popular histories that were written um, since then as apocryphal. Uh, some of the claims by popular historians that the seeds that grew into Glasnost and Perestroika were actually planted in Ottawa in 1983, uh, and that Gorbachev went on a walk with the Soviet ambassador to Canada, Alexander Yakovlev, um, the so-called walk that changed the world at the house of the Minister of Agriculture in Canada, Eugene Whelan in Amherstburg, Ontario. But I must say, the more I looked into it, um, even if I didn't subscribe to all the hype necessarily, I can argue now uh, that it really was a key moment on the path of reform. Uh, and as Larry um, told me too, an important moment for the Institute. 
So just as I borrowed memories from, from Larry and my colleagues, I, I also hope we can sort of crowdsource this talk and, and um, I'd be happy in the Q&A um, or in the chat for you guys to, to add your own voices, uh, memories of this time, um, either of the Institute, how you lived through it, or how you experienced the Gorbachev years, because uh, I think it's incredibly um, energizing <laughs> to really think of the Soviet Union uh, and the end of the Soviet Union at this time with all uh, the energy and enthusiasm and excitement that came with it. So in 1983, if I can just, there we go. Um, Mikhail Gorbachev arrived in Ottawa on May 16th for a tour that would take him to um, food processing uh, plants, meat packing plants and farms in Alberta and Southwestern Ontario. And if I allow myself a, a personal memory to preface this, as a, as a boy that before the Soviet leaders even, um, maybe my first memory of the Soviet Union that wasn't hockey related, uh, it was growing up on the West Coast and the Soviet grain ships that used to pull into the harbor in Vancouver. And I can remember um, being rather confused. First of all, this was a Cold War and I'd sort of grown up thinking the Soviet Union was the enemy. So why do they have all these ships pulling into our port? Uh, then finding out later that they were all loading up on grain from the prairie provinces to feed their own citizens, uh, which is a puzzle that I tried to, to deduce a bit later. And that's one of the reasons that I went to the Institute in the first place. But in 1982, uh, around that time when Gorbachev came, the USSR bought um, almost a billion dollars worth of grain annually from Canada. So this is a huge support to our farmers and also a huge sign of the deficits and problems in Soviet agriculture. And Mikhail Gorbachev came to Canada to try and figure out why Canadian farms were so much more productive, especially given that a lot of the um, topography, the landscape between the prairies and Ukraine say, you could make fairly um, strong arguments that they were quite similar, they should be as productive. Uh, so Gorbachev came, um, he wasn't just going to farms, he met Pierre Elliott Trudeau, of course, Prime Minister then, apparently for over four hours. Um, Prime Minister Trudeau was involved in arms reduction efforts at that time, so I imagine this is something that Mikhail Gorbachev and him talked about, and we know that was one of the main accomplishments of the, the Gorbachev uh, years in the Soviet Union. Uh, he then traveled to and traveled with the Soviet ambassador to Canada, uh, Alexander Yakovlev. Uh, Yakovlev's a, a fascinating figure, and I, I hadn't really known as much about him, obviously, <laughs> at the time or when I was at the Institute. But looking back, uh, he was a veteran of the Second World War, uh, wounded in Leningrad, uh, climbed quickly in the party apparatus, and was actually allowed to attend Columbia University in 1958-59, so you can imagine that was not something that any ordinary Soviet citizen uh, could do. Uh, allowed him to speak English fluently, of course. Uh, he was allowed to head the Soviet propaganda department in 1965 in the party, uh, but that didn't affect an independent streak that he had. And in 1973, which as you can imagine was not the um, a time, uh, it was a decade before Glasnost, it was not a time where there was a lot of open opposition, or if there was, it was, it was uh, cracked down on. He published an article in one of the major uh, journals, periodicals of the Soviet Union, Literaturnaya Gazeta, that criticized nationalism and anti-Semitism, which was growing at the time, we were now quite aware, um, in the Soviet Union, uh, including among Russians. And that article and subsequent discussions basically led to him being more or less exiled um, to Canada, where he served as Soviet ambassador. So as Gorbachev and Yakovlev set out on their tour, um, even though people like myself, and I'm you not know, too young, but it wasn't really necessarily a huge deal um, among the average uh, Canadian, even educated population, but our institute was keeping close track of it. Uh, Larry Black, that time was director, and our students had noticed Gorbachev, even then, was rather a unique figure, uh, interested in supermarkets and Western family farms. And so the Institute started to follow how Canada was being portrayed in Soviet newspapers, which was a, a great way for our students to bone up on their Russian um, and to really think about the Cold War in different ways, multi-perspectival, which is something the Institute really strives to do today. 
So the tour went well. Um, there was a trip to Alberta uh, and then to southwestern Ontario. Uh, Gorbachev rode um, the Maid of the Mist tour boat in Niagara Falls. Like every post-Soviet citizen, um, Canada seems to start and end with Niagara Falls, which I can never quite understand why. And I'd be happy to be enlightened on that <laughs> whenever uh, any Russian uh, here, so I've never been to Niagara Falls. They look at me with horror, um, which makes me determined not to go, just to to be contrarian. But um, maybe I am getting old. Um, in his memoirs, Gorbachev recalled the visit as inspiring and educational, as he saw how Canadian farmers worked in contrast to this are, these are his words: the decline in economic incentives uh, and inefficient use of resources in the Soviet agricultural system. So then came this walk that changed the world that I referred to um, earlier on uh, at the house of um, Minister of Agriculture, Eugene Whalen. And you can read the quote there if you haven't read it already by Alexander Yakovlev, uh, when they talked not only about um, foreign policy, the SS-20s were missiles, intermediate range missiles that the Soviet Union um, had planted in communist states in Eastern Europe. I can actually remember, when I went to Slovakia in 1994, seeing a, um, a missile, not silo, but sort of the, the truck, the, the um, holding for the missile, uh, right on the border with Austria. And these were missiles specifically designed um, to destroy Western Europe in case of some kind of um, major confrontation. Uh, so they were the, the subject of a lot of debate and discussion at the time. Uh, so Yakovlev was, and Gorbachev were talking about how this is making life very difficult for relationships with, with the West, as well as for the satellite states in Eastern Europe. Um, and then uh, when you look at Yakovlev's comments there, Gorbachev was concerned with internal reform. Uh, so both of those were, were tied together in their relationship. So it's hard to know, of course, looking back at these memoirs, looking back at these history books, what actually happened, how much is sort of built up after the fact. Uh, but whatever the case, it was quite clear that Yakovlev made a very strong impression on Mr. Gorbachev, um, who had him return to Moscow, where he became head of a prominent think tank, the Institute of World Economy and International Relations. Before he returned to Moscow, however, um, Yakovlev actually came to, to ICES, to our institute, uh, to give a talk in which he stressed the importance of Canada um, and kind of foreshadowed the fact that future changes um, would be coming to the USSR. Uh, this was about the time when Larry formed the Center for Canadian um, Soviet Relations. I'm, I'm misremembering uh, the, the actual wording. It changed a few times, like all of our institutes did over that time, uh, which employed several students from our institute and issued many publications during its run at Carleton. Um, Larry also remembered enjoying a rather well lubricated dinner um, with Alexander Yakovlev and Canadian Foreign Minister Joe Clark and others, uh, when Yakovlev again um, highlighted the importance of Gorbachev's visit uh, to his thinking. Uh, as he moved back to Moscow and eventually assumed power. Um, so for those of you interested in following up on Institute work at that time, there are bibliographies you can consult uh, that came out of this um, period in the Institute about the Soviet perception of Canada in the 1980s, which would make a great research essay topic, I would think. Uh, now when I think about sort of this time afterwards, um, you can see there a little bit later, um, Yakovlev and Gorbachev wearing um, looked like somewhat better cut suits uh, than they were in 1983, now that they were dealing much more with the West. Uh, Yakovlev became a key advisor to Mikhail Gorbachev, eventually moving into the Politburo. Uh, they aligned again on the loosening of party control and the desire to tone down the Cold War um, and focus on the domestic economy. Uh, he was one of the first reformers. Even in 1985, um, Yakovlev was talking about the need for democratization, multi-candidate elections, and real guarantees of human rights. But it wasn't an easy sell. Uh, politically, obviously, making those changes in 1985-86 in would have been uh, extremely difficult for Gorbachev as he was trying to consolidate um, his control in the party. And I don't think that he was as radical a reformer in practice in these early years. And I think I would agree when I was talking to Larry about Gorbachev was a Soviet patriot. He wanted the Soviet Union to work. 
uh, he wasn't really thinking that any of his reforms, there was no design that these would be ones that might tear the system down. Uh, some of his first efforts were an anti-alcohol campaign, though those things always fail, um, and a this, this term that he used called acceleration, uskorenia, with this belief that if people just worked harder, <laughs> like the Canadians worked on those farms, um, they would uh, be more effective. Uh, the end of, there's a, a classic joke that um, we imported from the Soviet Union at that time, uh, that Soviet citizens would tell to each other about they, and, and they meaning the state, um, uh, or yeah, they pretend, to, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. Uh, and this would seem to be what, um, what was happening when uh, there was all types of absenteeism, um, the, the plan targets were always being revised, there were various ways for um, corruption to sneak into the system, not a lot of incentives anyway, we could go on and on about that, and it's not my, the purposes of my, of my talk, but Klasnost was originally envisaged to be a way to make data transparent, with the idea that once planners and leaders knew about the nature of shortages and bottlenecks in the economy. They could fix them. They could get workers uh, working effectively. They could use incentives um, to bring the economy to a position, to a socialist economy that was effective um, and competitive with anything that the West uh, could, could throw at them. But just one reform led to another, and as people started to see the system opening up, as Glasnost and this openness exposed the level of problems and corruption in the Soviet economy, uh, and people started to demand more freedoms to uh, take, a, take on an active role in the state. And I think, in fact, that's what first happened. It was seemed rather um, benign, not a threat to the Soviet state. Uh, I remember when I was uh, first taking a course as a qualifying year student in the Institute, um, Bogdan Batsyurku, who was a the, uh, Soviet political science professor at the time, said Gorbachev really decided to allow civil society to define itself. There's a combination of humanism and realism in the fact that the system just was not able to economically um, make sense. Right. There was a lot of dynamism, but it was often in the gray economy or the black market or something like that. The state economy was, was very creaky, very slow, and he just couldn't see a way to change that without involving citizens. And I think citizens themselves wanted to take an active role. The other aspect of reform was to freeze the Cold War so he could sort of at least curb some of the military spending and gain cooperation. Uh, from the West in terms of knowledge exchange um, based on you know, his trip to Canada and some of these other uh, interactions he had had. Uh, Gorbachev was a European. He talked about our common home. Um, he was a globalist. He really believed that uh, the Cold War was not an effective use of resources and that two systems could uh, coexist quite peacefully. Uh, so he began by uh, introducing arms control programs in 1987. Uh, there was to reduce tensions with Western Europe. He uh, began to remove the SS-20 missiles as part of an intermediate range nuclear forces treaty. Uh, <clears throat> That's sort of what was led to call to the, the Gorbatsum. This is what I wanted to title my talk, but Precious wouldn't let me. Uh, Gorbachev traveling to Western Europe and being greeted by thousands, like tens of thousands of, of fans, admirers. Uh, and really, again, I don't think if you've lived through the Cold War, uh, if you haven't lived through the Cold War, you really understand what it was like, I, even in Western Europe much more than here, to really believe that there were missiles pointed at you that could go off at any moment. And, and um, you may have seen all these sort of apocryphal movies, Red Dawn and these kinds of things that, that have that flavor to it. But, for Europeans to start to think that maybe they didn't have to worry about Soviet missiles raining down on them or an invasion from the Soviet Union. This was, this was really something. And this led to Gorbachev's popularity uh, that then transferred to the 93 visit, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, then, of course, Gorbachev decided after that to no longer prop up economically or militarily these regimes um, the satellite states in the communist world. 
And so you can see the kiss that he gave the so the, the East German um, Chancellor Eric Honecker uh, there, just as he was telling him that he was on his own. And as, sure, as soon as East Germany and these regimes were on their own without popular support or Soviet military backing, uh, they crumbled um, more or less mostly peacefully, uh, which was somewhat surprising. Um, I guess we didn't really know what was going to happen, but you can see the Berlin Wall coming down there. Um, you can see some of the violence at the bottom with Nikolai Ceausescu, the uh, ruler of Romania, communist authoritarian ruler being shot, but uh, uh, violence was, was rare um, in these uh, popular revolutions as the regimes uh, really just eroded very easily without Soviet military support. And these are the memories that stay with us. And this is when I arrived shortly after the fall of um, East Germany and United, the, United Germany to the Institute. <laughs> and I can remember a couple of the students in the cohort before me were writing their um, research papers on um, the party systems in, in East Germany under Glasnost. And then all of a sudden the subject of their inquiry disappeared. <laughs> uh, so um, that was one thing that I realized being a historian is kind of nice because you don't have to worry about something like that. Um, every day was changing. Uh, things we could have never imagined happening. Uh, the first McDonald's in Moscow uh, in 1990, and the lineups for hours that people um, had. Uh, Pizza Hut came after that, and Mikhail Gorbachev actually started a Pizza Hut ad uh, not long before that in the Soviet Union. That's a, a Canadian McDonald's, actually, that um, it opened up, which uh, my colleague at, at McGill, Christy Ironside, is doing research on, beat me to it, because that's a wonderful topic to talk about. Um, now, I don't have time or uh, it's not the purpose of this talk to litigate the end um, of the Soviet Union, the reasons behind it. Uh, I'll just say briefly, we can talk about the loss of Eastern Europe and the introduction of market reforms produced cleavages in the party. Uh, its nationalist movements accelerated uh, by 1990 as well. Supply chains had broken down. There were food shortages and use of put this all together and, and you realize that the state uh, was starting to slip away um, from the communist leadership. Uh, the Institute had a front row seat for all of this. Uh, we published beginning in 1986, uh, a USSR documents annual. Um, so scholars and other interested parties could keep track of the changes. Uh, Larry recalls in 1986, writing a, a paper for DSTRAT A, which was, uh, one of the intelligence units then of the Department for National Defense, looking at nationalities um, issues and the realization that uh, we might have thought that that there was potentially some kind of Russian um, dominance over the other nationalities in the Soviet Union. That was that was theorized, and there was there was a lot of evidence for that. But what Larry found out, and of course what we know. Uh, we knew subsequently was uh, that all these major nationalities issues had nothing to do with Russians, but it was Armenians and Azerbaijanis over Nagorno-Karabakh. <clears throat> it was the Fergana Valley between Uzbeks and Kyrgyz. Uh, there were all kinds of different nationality issues that were just this ticking time bomb um, that didn't have to go off necessarily, but that did um, as Glasnost and as these um, educated elites who were kind of ready to seize power already. I mean, they we forget, I, I think, um, I can make the argument in some ways the Soviet Union was a, a victim of a success and that it, it moved from um, utter, utter devastation after the Second World War to producing a very modern, well-educated, urbanized society with a population that, that demanded um, rights and freedoms and goods uh, that the communist system just didn't seem to be able to provide. Uh, so I think you add all those together and, and we could always talk in the, in the discussion about the combination and, and you get um, an end of it, uh, of the Soviet Union. But I mean, it was the excitement of it all, I think, that, that caught us all by surprise how quickly it happened. And I can remember when I came, uh, there was a newspaper, our little sort of broadsheet called Soviet News and Views, that the Soviet embassy in Canada had been publishing for, I don't know, decades. Um, of all the, the news that was in Pravda and Izvestia. And of course, before Glasnost, it was, it was more or less street, state propaganda. Nobody cared, nobody wanted it. So they would be forced to sort of try and send it out to other embassies and to us. And then all of a sudden when Glasnost hit, 
Soviet News and Jews became the most popular um, publication you could get because it had all of these articles and every week something new was up for discussion. The talk of the Soviet past, talk of the terror, talk of the purges of, of the gulag, um, and talk of the possibilities of future reform. Um, so many requests for it, the Soviet embassy just decided they were overwhelmed and stopped publishing it. So we had to look for something else. Um, but nobody really knew at the time what was going to happen. Uh, even our, our colleagues um, in the Institute, we just we had to sit back and say, uh, we couldn't really imagine as different a world as the one that ended up happening. Uh, and I think too, we have to sort of look back now, we think of what's going on over this last couple of weeks in Ukraine and we see this sort of Cold War tensions in a different form. This wasn't what we were seeing or thinking about when the Soviet Union was about to end. It really did seem like this was it, like we could bring back Russia, um, these former Soviet states into a common European home. And that's what the excitement was about. And, and that opportunity was there in the 90s. And I, I, you know, I won't go into that. Again, I'll get myself too far away from the, the subject of the talk, but it's, a, it's very sad when you think that that opportunity was squandered. Uh, we had a lot of Soviet students who were here who were waiting with excitement, uh, realizing that they might be able to travel more freely. And once sort of Article 6, uh, which uh, was the in the Soviet constitution that pledged a uh, leading role for the Communist Party was abolished, then all of a sudden it started to become real. I mean, there were some disappointments too, uh, looking back at the time. Carlton had a number of faculty who grew up in Eastern Europe, uh, went back in the hope of trying to stimulate reform, try to become leaders, trying to offer advice, to offer the Canadian experience. They weren't always the, well, the, the best received. Uh, they were seen as uh, either abandoning their comrades, uh, their, their co-nationals in the Eastern Bloc, or seen as coming over and being somewhat patronizing, that somehow the West had offered a better path. And, and these people in Eastern Europe at that point, I think they obviously were very happy to get out from under the Soviet uh, domination for sure, but, but there, was not, there was a lot that they were proud of in their societies. And I think somehow in the West, we didn't really recognize that as, as well as we could have. Uh, and the NGO fatigue of a lot of Western organizations coming over and telling people what to do uh, happened quite quickly. Uh, you know, Larry points out the fact that the uh, trips that were probably the most successful were done by farmers, done by people where there was a real exchange of technical knowledge. And you didn't have this sense of, of patronizing or this, this sense of uh, one, one, one group of people teaching another like they were children. And I think that that was one thing that happened. So the 1991 uh, coup came in August. Uh, Gorbachev uh, was humiliated, uh, taken uh, prisoner by coup leaders, and then really yielded his leading role uh, to Boris Yeltsin, who was president of the Russian Federation uh, at that time, and overcame with, the, with his heroism, was seen to be a leading force in overcoming a Communist Party coup when Gorbachev was uh, taken prisoner. Uh, he never recovered from that. Uh, Yeltsin and some of his colleagues dismantled the Soviet Union in the years afterwards, uh, in the months afterwards. And then by the end of 1991, uh, Gorbachev did not have a state to rule over anymore. So looking now at the visit in 1993, uh, Gorbachev, of course, had been um, in the wilderness uh, in Russia, uh, but remained very popular in the West uh, for his uh, ending of the Cold War um, and his humanist values and his ability. He was very sort of savvy in the way he coordinated Western media. So this visit was organized by the Kiwanis Club uh, and linked to the Gorbachev Foundation, which the former Soviet president had founded as a think tank to do political, economic, and historical research. Uh, I think Gorbachev too just wanted to keep himself visible uh, he was going to publish his memoirs shortly afterwards, so this was like a pre-book sale tour, uh, a way to keep his name in the news. And also, by that time, he was already 
largely ignored um, or even reviled in Russia, which was in the throes of a horrible economic crisis. Uh, but he could come to Canada and he could gain that sense of uh, admiration, the sort of Canadian mini Gorbazm, um, as opposed to what he was having in the uh, <clears throat> in Russia, uh, the Russian Federation. And you can see an article um, in Maclean's uh, very sort of fawning that was published uh, when he came to Calgary, which was the first port part of his visit. Um, he was he with the University of Calgary was offered an honorary degree, just like Carleton did. Uh, and the, through the university, they agreed to help channel funding with the Gorbachev Foundation. Uh, Carleton had come. Uh, Carleton was next in line. Uh, Larry Black, again, who I've mentioned several times, who was head at that point, I do have the wording, Center for Research for Canada and the Soviet Successor States, uh, received a call from the Kiwanis Club uh, about uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and approached the university president, Robin Farquhar, about giving uh, a Doctor of Laws honoris causa, honorary degree to the former Soviet president, uh, which happened, obviously. You can see uh, the invitation there. It's a document from the, from the Carleton archives, uh, which I never thought I'd be exploring our university archives, but you just never know <laughs> where history is going to take you. Um, due to the timing, because it wasn't uh, there wasn't a regular convocation scheduled, there had to be a special additional uh, one for him on March 30th, uh, 1993. Uh, and you can see him uh, with Larry uh, walking beside and then his convocation address. Uh, it's funny for me, there's this 200 faculty. Oh, no, I missed that slide. But, um, 200 faculty who attended, uh, 65 ambassadors, special guests of myself and John de Bartleben, um, who you see there shaking uh, Gorbachev's hand. And this photograph is really um, quite funny for me because I, I remember when I shook Gorbachev's hand and my memory until I saw this photo of Joan was that Gorbachev was really short. And I think it was because I had imagined in my mind him as a larger, literally a larger than life figure. And I just thought somehow he would tower over me for everything he had done. And then when I shook his hand, he was just this ordinary guy. I looked up his height, he's about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, so not short, not tall. Um, but it was just the sheer weight uh, of doing it that, that I still remember. Um, and of course the birthmark is, <laughs> is something unique, but um, the fact that, and, and Larry sort of said this too, uh, he was very quiet during the trip. He didn't seem like someone who had changed the world um, as he did. He never really started a conversation. Um, he did talk to one of our colleagues, Carl McMillan, about how the 83 trip was a learning experience for him. Um, but generally, he was he was a, a, a very uh, smooth presence. Um, in fact, what, what Larry remembers is uh, more the, the rock star quality that his daughter, um, Arena, brought. Um, if the slides, are, there's Arena there, um, a bit earlier and then a bit later, uh, 1990s on the left, I guess, my left. <laughs> um, and then a bit later, um, Arena Vigantskaya, who uh, caused the RCMP no shortage of grief because every 10 minutes it seemed she would go out and grab a smoke and they weren't too happy about that security wise. And uh, she was always surrounded by a group of students who wanted to smoke with her when she was um, heading out. Uh, the Mounties also had problems with gate crashers at the gala um, that, uh, I think I have this, <clears throat> the gala that was um, afterwards, and you can see Brian Mulroney, uh, Prime Minister, for, former Prime Minister, and his wife Mila there, uh, mostly Russian-born students who actually just wanted to shake Gorbachev's hand, were anxious to meet him. Um, or I like recall, maybe more likely wanting to meet Irina. Um, some were apparently allowed in. Uh, and it was a very um, success, successful event uh, for Carlton. And certainly again, for me, I remember it um, almost 30 years later now. Uh, I, I do remember I mean, one of the issues that I remember was uh, the protests. So it wasn't uh, all smooth, well, I mean, smooth, smooth, but it was interesting too, that uh, for every Russian student who wanted to meet him, there were students from the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, who were protesting outside of the convocation address and, and really angry 
that Carlton was giving Mikhail Gorbachev a degree um, because uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was the, um, I can't remember if he was actually president uh, then, I think he was, this is January 1991, when he sent Soviet troops to crush nationalist opposition uh, in Lithuania and resulted in, in over a dozen deaths. So uh, there were those protests, but otherwise, the visit went out fairly smoothly. And Mikhail Gorbachev gave out many copies of books linked to his foundation, um, gave out a lot of pens, which didn't work, according to Larry. This was Russia in the 1990s, so maybe you can't expect. I've, I've gotten many pens that haven't worked, so maybe that's not <laughs> just that. Um, but for, for us, I think, at the Institute, this was uh, a culmination of, of this decade of studying, um, of, of really being at the forefront of intelligence. And I can remember how proud I was uh, when I came to the Institute and I was starting to um, really get involved and feel that I was at the center of something special. And pretty much every night I would turn on the national and it's still our, our major newscast. And, and there Joan would be with uh, Stephen Cohen um, and a couple of the, the top US commentators. And I thought, yeah, we're, we're a special place to study. And I, I still think we have this leadership rule and it was really highlighted then and we, we took it by the throat um, and we've never given it up since then. So I think the 93 visit both culminated in an era, um, but led to something uh, special afterwards. So just to conclude, uh, Gorbachev, um, as I mentioned, uh, by that time had been destatized uh, for someone who really didn't want to make the Soviet system work, we think at the time. By 1993, he was saying things like communism was a false utopia created by those who did not respect the proper development of people. Um, and it was a time when um, there were just no answers to a lot of these questions. I remember when I started my PhD in 1994 at University of Illinois and a colleague of mine who actually was quite sympathetic to, to Russia and the Soviet experience said, well, you know, this, Russia may be the country that showed that communism couldn't work, but now it's gonna be the country that showed that capitalism can't work. And, and that might be right. I don't know, we could, we could debate that or not. Um, but in the 1996 presidential election, which is really the last time we heard from Gorbachev politically, he received less than 1% of the vote. Uh, so you could tell that was sort of the sign that he was yesterday's man. Um, but we can remember him um, and that we played our part and our role in the Gorbachev era in 83 and 93 uh, and all the times in between. So thanks everyone and look forward to any questions or discussion.